in Ireland have been having TED Talks for thousands of years. <laughs> Uh, they, they weren't always called TED Talks. Um, they would have been facilitated by Shanachies, ancient storytellers. And it's not just Ireland. I think it's true of most ancient cultures and traditions. Um, and they, they wouldn't, of course, have been held in nice auditoriums like this. They would have typically have been in, um, in forests or in old stove buildings. And um, they wouldn't have had our incredible modern display technology and lighting. They often would have been held around a roaring fire uh, and used the imaginations of those who participated. But storytelling is really at the very core of, of who we are as people. It's a fundamental aspect of, of, of who we are. So I became a psychologist and a therapist via the world of media and filmmaking. I always loved storytelling, and I love the ability to be able to capture different media um, some radio, some TV, but particularly film was what really uh, inspired me or really captivated my imagination. And I liked it, but something I wanted to pursue more was the personalization of it. And I really, I think, saw from an early stage, both in my own experience, but also in, in the experience of those around me, the capacity we have to be able to use music, art, uh, the films that we watch, various media to be able to evoke different emotions. And, and, and this can be so much more than just entertainment. It could be something that can bring about uh, a very meaningful uh, and, and uh, very, very uh, uh, potentially permanent change as well uh, in those who participate. So something that we all have is a need to make sense of the world that we're in. We're always trying to map it and, and understand it in one sense or another. And this has always been true. It's been historically always the case. But of course, nowadays we see that the, the explosion of media means that we're literally surrounded by information. We're surrounded by clips. And there's a sense in which all of this is having an effect. Behavioral change isn't just something that's done in a therapy room. It's something that's happening whether we're consciously recognizing it or not. Uh, every day of the week as we are exposed to all of this different content. And um, from a therapeutic perspective, I entered into the world of therapy, as I say, via filmmaking. It struck me that we are in many ways a number of steps behind some of our colleagues in media and entertainment, in advertising, and in many other disciplines in terms of the, the types of methods that they use. So to quote our old Ted friend, Ken Robinson, you know, how are we doing? Well, good, you know, there's some good therapy being done. It really is being done, and there's no question about that. I see amazing work happening very simply. Um, we're also not doing that well, though, uh, in other respects, in terms of long waiting lists, the difficulties in finding good therapeutic support, and kind of a lack of nuance, I suppose, in the approaches that we use. So not good enough, I, I suppose, is really what it comes down to. And probably a better way of saying it in this case is, not as good as we could be doing it. Now, of course, it's one thing to be very aspirational. It's one thing to say, well, given unlimited time and resources, it could be this way. But it's quite another thing to say, well, given what our colleagues in other forms of behavioral change already do, it's not as good as that. I mean, even the sophistication of advertising, branding, the system supermarkets use for encouraging you to purchase, even from as far back as the 60s, some of these would be more sophisticated than some of the methodologies that we use today therapeutically. So it's an opportunity, and I think a very exciting one, because the explosion of media and ideas has created a greater need to make sense of the world, and we can use those various media to help us do exactly that. So a, a metaphor as such, or maybe just a direct example that I like to think of, is that of physiotherapy. And if we think of physiotherapy for the mind, I think that's probably the easiest way of thinking about what I want to advocate. You would be very disappointed if you went for an hour of physiotherapy and if you talked about anatomy for an hour uh, and then you left. Now, it's not that that isn't important. It's extremely important and you could gain a lot by talking about it. But there's a sense in which you do something else as well. You'd also get up at a certain point, you'd move, you'd practice it, you'd build uh, muscle tone. And the same thing is true psychologically. So, of course, some things lend themselves to this more than others. Sometimes we just need to talk to somebody, and literally we don't need to get up and move. 
But other times where we want to develop certain skills, we want to practice overcoming certain challenges, the sense of practicing that is very important. And as our colleagues in uh, occupational therapy show us too, it's very important to be able to have a real world context for the therapeutic work that we're doing, not just to simply um, uh, use a white room and, and, and to try and expect that change to generalize, to be able to bring challenges into the therapy room and equally bring the therapy and the reinforcement out into day-to-day -day life as well. So the emotion of that matters too. It can't be an intellectual process. So to be able to stir feelings like every good film director is able to do, every good singer or musician knows how to do, these are the types of skills that we need in the therapeutic process. And gladly, it's happening. There are many forms of therapy which maybe traditionally would have been considered eclectic. Dance therapy, art therapy, play therapy, and, and so many others. So this is nothing new, but we need that to be more the mainstream. We need it to be more in line with the kind of media experience and behavioral change that we're already encountering from so many other sources too. And I think that is starting to happen right now. Now what's come to meet us at least halfway is technology. So we now have um, old fashioned technology, which is gonna be as simple as just using our imagination. We also have much more modern technology, such as virtual reality, which is where we put a headset, a head mounted display on and that allows us to enter different worlds, maybe to access resourceful places that can help evoke certain feelings which can help us in our life, or maybe to help us uh, overcome challenges in phobic or difficult situations so we can desensitize, do some exposure therapy to overcome the fear and build confidence. And also augmented reality, which is, for example, if somebody has a phobia of spiders, you can now look through a device and you can see the spider wandering over towards you. It's not really there. It's much more practical than having a real spider in the room. It allows for more control. But technology is helping us in this way. And mixed reality, which is a bit of a broad term, but think Disneyland. Think about the combination of the physical, the virtual, and the imaginary in different ways to be able to create meaningful experiences. So this doesn't need to be left to just entertainment. And for the Shanaki telling that story thousands of years ago, potentially here in the forests of this area, it wouldn't have been just entertainment. It would have been news. It would have been instructional. There would have been a sense of learning taking place in the narratives. And the more they engaged the imagination, which typically they would have, the more that would have been happening. And they would have been, those stories, a form of therapy. So in thinking about the, the science behind this, the science of perception, which is, is really what we care about here in terms of doing good therapy. If, if we want to change perception, we need to know something about it. Something which is rather fascinating about our engagement with media is our ability to, on an emotional level, not be able to tell that easily the difference between fact and fiction. So starting off in an obvious sense, when we're in a real world environment and something's happening, we get that we're there, we have an emotional response to what's happening, and, and that's fairly non-problematic. But of course, then if you walk into a cinema and you're watching a film of that same event, this is interesting, because if it's directed well, if it hits the right emotional notes, you'll have a similar type of experience. Your adrenal system can be activated, you'll get that fight or flight response, even if it is just an action hero you're identifying with on the screen. And we seem to forget in some respect that it's only light being reflected onto a wall. We, we invest in it emotionally and change can come from that. So we might say, okay, fair enough, but at least visually it's similar. We've got the screen in front of us, we're at least seeing it. Our system believes that in some way to be real. But then how do we answer the question of how a book works? I mean, there could be nothing less sensorily stimulating than a book in many respects. You've got black text on white paper. That black text bears no particular relationship to the thing we're imagining other than true convention itself. But yet, as we know, a good book is able to evoke very, very powerful emotions. You can laugh, you can cry just by reading those words. So uh, this tells us something, and, and as John Lennon said, reality leaves a lot to the imagination. And uh, in Ernest Hemingway's work as well, we see this idea that the majority of the story exists beyond the page. And the reader is bringing so much uh, to the, the, the story in that moment. And um, this is interesting because when you close the book and you walk away, you can carry the thoughts of the book with you. And those thoughts are a form of media too. 
that plays internally within us. So we internalize various ideas, belief systems, and feelings depending on our life experience, whether it's in our distant past or whether it's more recently. And in a sense, we carry these media, we download them, and we carry them around with us in some shape or form, and they affect us. And they say that fish will be the last to know what water is, and that's the problem. We're often so close to this screen that we forget it's even a screen. We forget that we've got options, which can include turning off the TV altogether, practicing interrupting thinking and stopping, or it can include changing the channel. Maybe we like thinking, but we want to think different thoughts, put on a channel that we want to watch. Or even if we can't find the remote and we just want to leave the thing on, you still don't have to buy into it. If there's an infomercial on trying to sell you something that you don't want to buy, you can leave it on but still not buy it in, in some sense. There could be a space between you and the experience. So these thoughts and feelings aren't good and bad in and of themselves. Fear can be exactly the perfect emotion in a situation of genuine danger, and we may want that. And relaxation in a dangerous situation may be the thing we wouldn't want. So it's not about the good or the bad. This is more like notes in a piano, a high note, a low note, but no wrong note. But there may be a wrong note for a given song or for a given moment. And so being able to navigate this is really what we want. So the body's adrenal system, it believes, uh, essentially, the, the, the things that we invest in intentionally. And we can see why. For Uncle Bob, thousands of years ago, who was trying to survive, the lion or the tiger, the actual biting of Uncle Bob's arm, that was a poor moment in which to experience the emotion of fear. It would be better off if the imagination triggered it, fueled by the approach of the animal. Or better again, when he heard a rustle in the bush, then the system kicks in. So we seem to have evolved or developed a system that is very good at preempting, at being cued by the imagination, rather than just the physical reality which of course has advantages. But of course the problem is nowadays that running, that fighting isn't something we need to do as much as our ancestors would have. And that adrenaline of course can lead to at least fear and very often health difficulties and other problems as well. So uh, therapy's job, as I like to see it, is to be a type of physiotherapy for the mind to help us practically work with this, which will include talking about it, but it will also include getting up and, and working with this, helping to overcome fear and to access resourceful states as well. So in trying to think of a, of a language to discuss this, there are a variety of, of, of theories and, and frameworks uh, that, that, that I use as part of my research. But a simple way of thinking about it is if we think about the, the physical, and then if we think about the imaginary, we can see that there's a sense in which I can Look at this red circular carpet here, and we can say this is physically present. But there is a sense in which we can close our eyes, and we can still have a sense of that red carpet, and that has certain affordances for us. It still works. That's good, but uh, it's a bit binary. And a more helpful way of thinking about it is a spectrum, in many ways, between the physical and the imaginary that we move between. And this is what I call in my research an experiential load, which is basically the sense that when we're having an experience of something, to what degree is the environment giving it to us, or what degree are we bringing it to the table, so to speak. And just a lovely, simple, concrete example of this is speaking. What's happening right now? I'm speaking words, I'm making sounds, but these are just sounds. If this makes any sense at all, I hope it makes a little sense, if it makes any sense at all, that's you doing that. I'm just making sounds. Somebody who lacks uh, familiarity with the English language or lacks familiarity with the concepts being discussed, this is just sound for. So we can see that it's not as simple as the physical or the imaginary. The speech or the book would be another example of this. It's sort of meeting you halfway. I'm using words, but I'm stirring your own imaginations and you then are filling in the blanks with your content and bringing it forward. So we're doing this all the time, and it's sometimes called the difference between perception, as in seeing what's in front of us to some degree, and apperception, which are the gaps that we fill in with our imagination. We're doing this con 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 constantly, even visually. We have a blind spot in the eye, but our mind fills in the blank, and we don't see it. And the problem is this leads to assumptions. This very often leads to worrying and difficulties. 
And the problem essentially is that we take the imagined to be physical. Like Uncle Bob, these worries and these concerns, our mind tries to help us by thinking of problems preemptively, which of course would be good if we could do something about it. But sometimes what we end up doing is practicing the problem rather than actually addressing what's in front of us. So there is a word um, which uh, the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget used, which I think is a nice word for this purpose, which is equilibration. And equilibration is the idea of a kind of a nice marriage between the physical and the imaginary so that they're complementing and assisting each other rather than competing with each other. You see this for an architect who maybe walks through George in Dublin, is inspired by it, gets an idea for a new design, but then doesn't just leave it in the world of ideas, then they create a prototype, which in turn creates more ideas, and then in turn they build something. So this playful intermixing of the, the physical and the imaginary in that way. And I think that's our goal therapeutically. And this is gonna become all the more important as we're exposed to more and more media, and we know there's plenty of it. So in order to, to navigate this effectively, there are really two things therapy can do. And I want to think of therapy as having a small T, not the Victorian notion of an hour in a room with a bearded guy. That's fine, that might be good therapy. But therapy can be simply the act of walking down the street and having an experience. It can be being away on a holiday. It can be any awe-inspiring moment. So some of those moments, some of the therapy that we're going to do is going to involve just recognizing the fact that we are surrounded by media, which include thoughts as well as books, as well as smartphones, the internet, et cetera. And rather than our thoughts thinking us, us thinking them. So being more mindful and deliberate uh, as we approach this. And the other part of it is, hey, if you can't beat it, join it. If there's a lot of media out there, let's not be on just the receiving end of that. Let's take media, let's use it to be able to inspire positive emotions, to be able to evoke resourceful states within people, and to be able to help them practice overcoming challenges and difficulties. Virtual reality, mixed reality, these technologies are wonderful for this purpose. But good old fashioned imagination can do a very good job as well. So in closing, they say that politics is too important to be left to politicians. Therapy is far too important to be left to therapists. So please, let's make this a collaborative process. Let's see therapy with a small t as something we can all participate in. And let's join together, whether formally or informally, in creating a world that's at least cognitively ergonomic that helps us all. Thank you very much.